First of all, we have Travis Prince as our moderator. Uh, if you don't know Travis, he's a uh, does a lot, very talented artist. He's also the winner of the prestigious Bielen, F. Lamont Bielen Fellow, uh, Fellowship Scholarship Award, which is quite prestigious in this area. Uh, we have Lisa Hall. Um, love working with Lisa. We were just talking about that. She is the director of the University of Scranton Small Business Center. Great resource here. Um, I'm going to, who's uh, Sarah Merritt is uh, next to, sorry, lost my notes. She is from the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, and I don't know, I lost, I know you have a great title. You That's direct the Creative I Communities. I'm the Director of Pennsylvania Creative Communities and the Creative Economy. I couldn't remember, I couldn't, okay. I, I couldn't okay. remember that. And next to her is Amanda Lovell, um, who oversees the Director of Creative, you know what? I just started fairly recently, so forgive me if I don't even remember my title. <laughs> oh, I have it here. I you did not disappear. Access, access to, to the creative, creative sector. Sarah, help me out. I have that. a long that's title, my, too. That's my role. Deputy <laughs> Director of Arts and Culture for Lackawanna County. I, I can't even remember my own title <laughs> at the time. Um, we have Dan Kimbrough, does a lot of things, but he is the owner of Park Multimedia. Um, that, was, that was easy to remember. Uh, and then next to Dan, we have Megan Passamato. He is one of our arts council members, but also the owner of On and co-owner of On and On. And if you haven't been there, it's an amazing experience over there on Kapowice Avenue. It's kind of like a museum of lots of stuff to buy, vintage, antiques, a lot of fun stuff. So she's, she has a really interesting business model. And then we have a special guest from Philadelphia. Uh, Chrissy Bonner is, uh, um, owns an illustration uh, and design uh, company. So we're going to hear a lot of good stuff from her experience. Um, okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Travis now. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Appreciate everybody for being in attendance. Thank you to our panelists up here for uh, agreeing to help educate all of us on uh, creative small businesses. So I wanted to start out with a question for Sarah, Amanda, who are from the Pennsylvania Council of Arts and Lisa Hall from the University of Scranton Small Business Development Center. Uh, my question for you ladies is, what resources are available regionally and statewide if someone wanted to start a small business? Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. So resources, um, the, the, one of the greatest things about Northeastern Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania um, is that you have tons and tons of resource providers um, to support you, whether you want to get started in business or you have an existing business or you have an idea, there's tons and tons of people. So at the Small Business Development Center um, at the University of Scranton, we serve eight counties in northeastern Pennsylvania and the northern tier, um, but there are small business development centers across the state, um, and we help people. We meet you where you are, so you don't need to um, have any you know, prior experience or any business knowledge or anything when you come through our doors. Um, we are going to help you whether you just have an idea or some thoughts or something that you really want to dig into. So one-on-one -on -one assistance, um, confidential, and uh, trainings, webinars, things like that as well on a variety of different topics. And we work with many of the partners that are in this room that were mentioned earlier, um, making connections. If we don't do something, there's someone who does. So making connections, answering questions, um, you know, that's one thing really strong in Northeastern Pennsylvania is that um, network of people. We always reach out to each other, work together to try to, to give the best possible service to the person. And it can be um, very confusing when you look at all that. I mean, you probably heard a bunch of acronyms already this morning, and that can be quite confusing. But just know that if you come to any of us that are in the room, um, we're here to connect you with education and guidance and support and financing and funding and all of those kinds of things. So just don't be afraid to ask um, those questions. Just don't ask me to do anything creative. <laughs> that would be a big mistake. So you need to stick with that, and we'll we'll take care of kind of the business side of things. Testing. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm not sure. I'm just curious. How many of you are familiar with the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts? I'd just like to see a show of hands. So 
about, yeah, okay, that's about typical. Um, I guess I'll say really quick, just give you a little, for those that don't know, a little background on the Council on the Arts. Um, the Council on the Arts is a state agency. We're under the office of the governor. Uh, the council has been in existence since 1966. And we provide about 1,600 grants a year in all 67 counties across Pennsylvania. Uh, there are 10 of us on our staff. So Lisa and I were just talking about small staffs with big jobs. Um, so we, we're, we try to be out in communities all across the state and serve them. Um, one of the things that we did about right before the pandemic was we embarked on our, our new strategic plan. Uh, which entailed about a year of information gathering across the state. And one of the things we heard, as here we are a traditional grant-making agency, from community members was that we needed to better support and help strengthen communities and in their endeavors. And so a couple of really great things have come out of that. Um, one of the, those programs is a, the program that I direct, Pennsylvania Creative Communities, which does have a workforce and small business development element to it. So if you have a creative placemaking project in your community, there are opportunities to work with small business owners, creative small business owners through that program if that's what your, your community designates it to be. But additionally, right before the pandemic, we embarked on something that wasn't grant making, and we started the Creative Small Business Loan Fund. And that fund is administered in this state by two of our really great community development finance institutions. On the western part of the state, that's Bridgeway Capital. But in your region, that would be Community First Fund. And they're based out of Lancaster, um, and they're starting to spread their, you know, really try to spread out in, in all across the eastern part of the state. Those are, if you're not familiar with community development finance institutions. They are very, very competitive um, rates. Uh, it's not like going to a trad traditional lender. And there's a real focus on BIPOC, um, low income, rural, and women owned businesses as well. And so that's an, a, something that's available to small businesses. I do know that in this region, in your, the eastern part of the state, it's, it's got a little bit of a slow start. That's not a, a you know, not, a, 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 I'm not, Say anything bad about Community First Fund, I think they're just getting into this work with really understanding what a creative small business is and, and how a creative entrepreneur is thinking about their small business. So there are there is definitely funds available through the loan fund. All right. So um, one of the other opportunities we have in the state, sorry, I'm just trying to... I could probably not even use the mic and you'd be able to hear me. <laughs> but um, So we have the Creative Entrepreneur Accelerator Program. This is a very new program um, for the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. And let me tell you, creatives across the state have truly embraced this program. It has really gone off with a bang, which is really exciting to see um, so many entrepreneurs taking advantage of the opportunity. Um, so essentially, in partnership with the Small Business Development Centers, Lisa, in this area, um, you not only get access to um, a grant to actually help kickstart your um, your small business, or maybe you're already in business and you just need a little push, um, so there's that as well, but you also get resources to help develop your business plan, um, which I know, you know, oh my gosh, the dreaded business plan. <laughs> Who has written a business plan in this room? Okay. <laughs> I'll put my hand up 10. I think I've written 10. I'm not even joking. One advice I would say, though, don't get stuck in your business plan. As an entrepreneur, it's really easy to do that, to not go beyond that business plan. But the business plan is essential. And so I think that's what the beauty of this um, program is, is that you're not only getting access to funding, but you're also getting access to an amazing resource in our small business development centers across the state. And locally, it is um, Lisa at the University of Scranton. So... Um, you know, please t take advantage, and I, you know, I'm available to chat more about it. There's information on our website. Um, but so to date, in six months, 294 um, entrepreneurs across the state, creative entrepreneurs across the state, have taken advantage of it. And what what is a creative entrepreneur? Is that a tricky question? Also, I don't know. Um, it can sometimes be a tricky question, but uh, you know we're looking at marketing, graphic design, designers, interior design, wood making. Um, what else do we have? We have fashion. We have filmmaking. 
Um, we have traditional fine arts and visual artists, music, photography, pottery. Somebody else yells some out other things that you might think. Um, architecture. Gaming. Gaming's a huge one. Um, even publishing, writing, um, being an author. So it's amazing to see, you know, how this has been embraced, and I just truly encourage you all um, to look into it further. So, yes. That's an amazing question, and actually, um, I would say it would be in conjunction. It would be at something you're doing at the same time. You'll need that business plan, honestly, for financing. That is something that many, it's, it's a requirement. It is. If you're getting financing, you'll need that business plan. So I think it's, it's the total package. You're working at the same time on all of these things. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Very well answered, ladies. Appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> my next question is for Chrissy. Uh, if I'm correct, you traveled here from Philadelphia. I myself had to introduce myself to um, everyone on the panel except one person. So my question is, is networking uh, and building a network, how important is that to a small creative business? Yeah, I would say that networking is essential. Um, I think it's a, it's a place to um, learn because, um, you, you know, things are changing really rapidly for all of us and our ways of working and delivering our services and products are changing. Um, it's a way to stay in community and, you know, uh, belonging, especially for people who um, may be freelancers and not have a team to work with. I think mm. it's really essential. Um, and then to get really granular, I think it's also just to stay um, on top of pricing, you know, what people are charging. So I, I would say it's essential. And my advice about finding a network is to find one that really feels like your tribe, um, that you want to be a part of. Like, you know, if you feel like you want to join the Chamber of Commerce and that's your tribe, go for it. Um, but there could be other communities um, where you're going to find yourself really wanting to go to and be a part of. So I would say seek those out. Nice. So networking is a uh, team building um, and more of a collaborative way just to help each other's business grow and prosper. Great. Um, my next question is for Dan. Uh, nowadays, many sp small business owners, uh, we're like proficient enough to do our our own um, content creating and things like that. So how important is it for, for us to be able to tell our stories to make our business grow? Um, I'd argue it's probably one of the most important things <clears throat> that a business can do. Um, when you think of uh, corporate and major brands, we all know, you know whatever story they've dealt us, like we know their stories. And I think one of the things that small business owners forget is that when choosing between a corporate brand or your brand or another small business, it's not about the product, it's about you. And so how you connect with your audience, with your potential clients, with your community, your neighborhood, and your network, that's what will make the decision of whether or not someone chooses you over someone else. And so, and not that it's a competition, I really do believe, you know, in thinking about networking, that it's really about more about community and that there are things that I do that, I can, that you know, other people in the community don't do, so I will work with them. And there's things that, I don't, that they don't do that I'll do. And so I think it's more community-based. But your story has to sort of be what you lead with. When you're building your business plan, business plans talk about, you know, what's the impetus behind this? Why are you doing this? You know, you have to understand yourself. And so if you're not, and it doesn't have to be you as the business owner, but whatever your business is, if you're not out there and you're not putting yourself forward, that story gets lost and you're just another product and you don't want to be just another product. And so figure out what your story is. Um, during the pandemic, one of the big things that I told a lot of companies were put your employees out front. You know, if you think of, I always think of um, State Farm, right? Like the original Jake from State Farm and the one that they have now, like we all know Jake from State Farm, right? Jake didn't work at State Farm. He's an actor, right? But like, we feel like we know Jake from State Farm. So you have actual employees who are in the community, who go to local grocery stores, who come to events like this, who people are going to see. That's another way to network is that if we know who your employees are and their stories as well, because that's part of your story, that builds your brand and does a lot of the work for you so that before you walk in a the door, they already know you. They know who you are. They know what you're about. And so... Storytelling is it's probably the most important thing nice. that leads off everything else. Yeah. 
Great answer, great answer. Um, last but not least, I have questions for everyone. So, uh, Megan, uh, with many different ways to set up a business, uh, sole proprietorships, LLC, cooperatives, uh, limited partnerships, and so forth, so on, can you talk to us about the business model of on and on, and moreover, what type of business structures can help artists manage their businesses? Sure. Well, I can talk about on and on. Um, we, what we do is we, well, I started off as an artist um, with a marketing background. So I made my art on the side, kind of wanted to branch out, start um, our own business with my partner, and realized that we couldn't make a business out of just making candles and selling purses. So because we have, we're entrepreneurs, we have a business background, we thought, let's start something where we can be a home to many different artists. And because people have day jobs, and most people can't create their art and make a living off of it right away. So what we do, we have about 60 different artists and vendors under one roof at On and On. And we rent out spaces to them, depending on their space requirements. They set up their own shop within our shop. That's their home. That's their business address. But they don't have to be there. They come in to, you know, restock when, when they need to be there, they come in, but we man the shop. We market the shop. We have consistent business hours. We're there all the time. So that's what On and On does, and that's how we help other, you know, creative businesses. And we give them a start because people come to me all the time, and they're like, do you think this would sell in your shop? And I'm like, if I've never sold that before, I don't know. You know, so it's a really easy way to test the market, you know, to pay me $25 a month for your little spot and you can kind of test it to see if people like it, to see if people like this, but they don't like that. Um, so I'm not quite sure about how to answer about setting up as an LLC or Lisa might be better at that. I mean, I know we set up as an LLC, but that's a whole different situation. <laughs> Maybe Lisa can take that. That's probably a more complex um, yeah. question for individual consulting, I yes. would say. Yeah. But, I, but I would add, I think the, the model of, of On and On and other businesses like that, it it's, works for people. And I think one of the things that I always think about is, you know, people dream of things. You all have dreams. We, we all have dreams of things, right? So you might dream of owning your own storefront or something big. And that's great to dream of something something big, but success, like you have to think about how you define success and really dig deep on that because you you may not be suited to have that big storefront. Or like Megan said, maybe you could never make a total full-time um, you know, business out of whatever you're doing, but it could still be very fulfilling and it could still be successful. And sometimes opportunities like this or farmer's markets or the different um, vendor fairs and things like that can offer an excellent opportunity for people to sell direct to the consumer and it can be one of the best options for some people. So some will have storefronts and some will have um, tables somewhere and some will have a vendor space but to me I, I always think of comparison as the thief of joy like yes you have to look at your competitors and do a healthy analysis but um, but also look at what's best for you and your product and you know figure that out and be comfortable with that too. Right. And Another part of it is you're an artist, you want to create your art. Being at a store from 9 to 5 every day, you know, there's no chance to create your art. Really, you're, you're manning the store. So it makes it really hard, and I, I know I have friends who've opened up their own businesses, and it's hard to keep consistent hours. It's hard to be there when you say you're going to be there. And, but anybody knows that runs a business, you have to be there when you say you're going to be there. So it's, it, there's a fine line, and that's... When you're looking into doing this, it might make sense to go in with other people so you can kind of split it and so you can still do your art. Nice. I, I find that that's one of my uh, major issues as well as being a, a creative and being a marketer, advertiser, and everything else for your business. It's hard to kind of like find that time for both of them. So this is a question that's open for the entire panel. Um, now we, we are in a, in a new age where we don't necessarily need uh, TV commercials or radio spots or any, anymore. We have the internet and we can 
advertise ourselves through uh, different social media platforms. So how important is social media marketing and advertising to a small business? It's essential. It's, I mean, we do pretty much 100% of our uh, marketing through social media. And we have a good following, and we sell things through it. We remind people we're there. And it makes me crazy when I talk to other small business owners who say, I really don't have time to post every day, or I don't have time to do that. And it's our first thing to do, we do. Our employees, that's their, that is their goal. They have to get three posts out a day. And we have to take care of customers, but that is, they come in early to get that done because it's, it's essential. I just want to say, make sure on those business plans, you had a marketing plan. <laughs> so many people, they don't think they need to add that for some reason. And I'm helping them in the later stages. And I'm like, where's your marketing plan? You have no money put towards this. You know, they're like, ah, no, not, ah, you know, you're missing out on an opportunity. I think social media is important, but I also have to say, just looking at trends in marketing, I was just talking a little bit about this. Um, I do feel there is still um, a path and a way um, with more of like guerrilla style marketing. Not everybody, you're not reaching everybody on social media. Social media, people are becoming a little numb to it as well. I'm making light flickers. Maybe there's a ghost that agrees with me. I don't know. Um, but there's still something about um, connecting face to face with people. There's still something about like a flyer, posting it on a, a community business board. I think you have to be, uh, definitely social media, you have to have a presence, but don't rely 100% on it because people are becoming um, a little numb to it. So I think you have to use every resource you can be creative about in, in looking at your marketing. That's just my little side note. Sorry. Um, I'm going to agree that I don't think television and radio and newspaper are dead because I don't think that those were ever the goal. It's video, it's audio, it's print. And I think as long as you think of it in that way, no marketing is dead. And so whether or not your, your video is on a television station, on the big screen, on someone's cell phone, you still need video. Whether it's in print, whether it's a flyer, it's a guerrilla marketing style, whether it's in a newspaper, you still need a print avenue. If you have a podcast or you're doing radio shows, I think, we, I think that's one of the big problems that we think about the end destination of the media and not think about the story behind it. And so wherever you put it, whether it's guerrilla, whether it's traditional, whether it's online, you still need that message to be put out there. And so where it goes will be determined by the market and the audience. And so if your audience is more guerrilla style, then you may not need as much time on social media. If your market is a little bit older, you may need, still need to buy time on News Station 16. You know? And so where your market is and your audience and your product will determine where your media goes to. But at the end of the day, we've never changed media. It's print, it's visual, it's television, it's audio. Like Those things don't change. It's just keeping up with where we need to put it and where attention is in that moment. So, nice. yeah. um, I have one second. Sure. So I would also say, and these are all really great points, and I mean, I think uh, you, you've been a small business owner as well. I, I was too a long time ago. But one of the other things too is just, and I know it's really hard when you're trying to run a business and get your products together and market and do all those things, but being, it, it also goes back to that networking piece is really being involved in your community, finding ways to um, you know, be part of events or be on committees and just really getting your face out there because you are the face of your business, right? And when people see that you're really invested in the community where your business is, then they want to, you know, frequent your business and, and you know, and support you. So that would be the other thing I would say too. Nice. Um, <clears throat> talking about uh, different demographics and group, groups that we try to target for our businesses. Um, once again, an open question for the panel. Uh, is there a specific demographic and age group that you focus on for your business and why or why not? It's kind of like um, a skateboard shop versus an antique shop, uh, like analog digital versus posh or, you know, so. Is, is that a, a way to 
uh, build your focus more if you actually try to focus on a certain demographic or no? I think it depends on the business. Like, so me, I, I run a, a media marketing company. So like mm -hmm. I focus on anyone who walks in the door. Um, and so it's less that I'm going after a specific audience. But I think if you are a business that has a niche audience, I would argue 80% of your audience, your focus needs to be there. But your audience will age out. You're going to get new folks that age into it. Interest nationally, regionally, globally, things change. I mean, um, if you told me 15, 20 years ago that Korean pop music would be something that we need to pay attention to in America, <laughs> right? Um, but now, you know, K-pop stars are some of the not top rating artists. And so yeah. if you're into that style of art or music or whatever that culture is, like, you need to pay attention to that. And so I think it really, I think, again, I think it goes back to what's not so much trending, but understanding your audience and being prepared to who's eventually going to leave because you can't keep a, a a client or a, cons a consumer forever, but that new people are going to come in who have different interests as well. And so know your audience, spend 85, 80 to 85 percent of your time on them, but realize that there are more people because once that audience is gone, if you haven't taken care of who's coming up next and coming in, you'll be out of business shortly. So mm -hmm. that's my thought. And I'll add a plug um, just for SBDC services. Of one of the things we do, if that's all making your head spin, you know, we have access to research tools. We can help nail down that those demographics. Um, I have to say, we have three awesome interns. Wave, everyone! Thank you. <laughs> uh, they support our business consultants in doing research, so they're often behind the scenes, kind of digging in to try to figure out and help you figure out who is that target market, how, how are they changing, what are their habits, and those kinds of things. So I will always say we're nerds at the SBDC. Um, you, might you might hear some of this stuff and think, this sounds terrible, but we think, like, yay, this is a great project. So these are the types of things we love to assist people with. Nice. Um... If you could give one piece of advice to anyone starting a creative small business, what would it be? Oh, just one? <laughs> the one really good piece of advice. I know. Okay. Um, I know, right? Well, I think I actually already mentioned it. Don't get stuck in the business, business plan, plan, in your head, yeah. in the planning, in the what ifs. If the you just at some point have to jump, and you just mm -hmm. some point have to take the plunge and do it, and you might fail. You probably will fail a few times over in certain areas, but um, I know I made that mistake a couple times. I got stuck in my head, and I was so afraid to move past that business plan. And so I think you know that's a probably my number one. Mm -hmm. um, thing but also kind of to piggyback off of what we just spoke about um it does sound like there is so much involved in being an entrepreneur there really is but you have to have your pulse on everything happening around you don't stay in your bubble um, you have to be aware of what's happening socially, politically, economically, in your community. Um, you have to read the newspaper, you know, you have to read different magazines that don't pertain to anything that you're doing. Um, you know, you just have to really branch out, travel, go to different restaurants, really engage in everything going around you because that's going to help inform the decisions that you make as an entrepreneur. But those are two things, so I'll pass it along. <laughs> So I, th my biggest piece of advice is to test your market. Before you go into business, you know, before you go, make sure that there's a market for what you're selling. Mm. And even though you love to create something, doesn't necessarily mean there's somebody out there that wants to buy it and that you can do that. Even before we opened on and on, we tested the concept. We did some first Fridays. We, you know, used a space. We used the Leonard Theater um, and did three different first Fridays where, where we got vendors together. We did a pop-up market. Brian was there. Um, we did a pop-up market and it was super successful. You know, we advertised, we made posters, we put them everywhere and super successful. And we knew we had something that we could take and make something out of it. And then we rented a space first. We worked with the SBDC. And, you know, we kind of grew it from there. But we tested it. We, we knew it was going to work before we took the jump. Um, a Can few I just more? add one sure, thing? Sure, sure, sure. So I would also say, you know, when you talk about resources, don't be afraid to reach out to those resources. That I, I can't tell you how many times I know Amanda's newer, but she's probably had to say this a bunch of times. I am constantly having to tell people, 
My job is to make sure communities get money. So ask questions. Don't be afraid. There's no stupid question. You know, I'm sure you guys probably have that same experience. People are afraid to take that step. Don't be afraid to take that step and reach out to people. We're not going to be mean. We're not going to put you off. We're not going to say your idea is crazy. We're, we want to find a way to support you. And if we can't do it, we'll help you find a, that, uh, that other resource that would be available to you. Um, sure. I had just another bit of advice um, about starting a business, mm -hmm. um, and this this is based on my experience, and I maybe more specific to visual arts and visual artists. Um, I'm right. There. But I think um, the expectations, as far as like our clients, as with regard to professionalism, are tragically low. Mm. So, you know, to the extent that you can exceed that, it's awesome. Um, and when you you know, you can you can start to exceed that by just being professional, like communicating who's going to be there, what they're going to bring, how it's going to look, um, deadlines, things like that. And that's critical because when you're starting a business, repeat clients are are going to be the thing that keep you out of the hustle. Like so, if that first year and a half you're just hustling, trying to meet people. Um, so if everybody you met in the first year, like if half of them come back the next year, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, but just keeping in mind that every client that you have like could be somebody who comes back next year, and then, and then you're not having to scramble every year to um, you know, pay your mortgage. Yeah. Um, and the one thing I'd say from the creative aspect is make sure you love whatever it is you do enough to hate it. Because at some point, if you're running a business, you will hate it. There have been times that I've never wanted to touch a camera again in my life. And three or four days later, I pick it up and go back to work. But make sure you love it enough to hate it because at some point, if this becomes your day job, you're doing this all the time and you're going to have to take a break. And if you can't love it enough to hate it, don't do it because you will hate it at some point. Yeah. Uh, Chrissy, I can agree with the professionalism point. Uh, for some reason, visual artists, we just have this stigma about us that we're not very professional. We're kind of lazy and not on time and very organized. And so uh, personally, I, I do take uh, that advice to heart because I try to, to be as professional as I can when it comes to uh, handling events and art clients and things like that because repeat clients will keep you afloat. Um, we have a few more questions here. Um, once again, for the entire panel, whoever can chime in. What significant challenges did you face in your transition to become an official business? <laughs> Don't answer all at once. <laughs> well, for me, um, it, it was finances. It was knowing... Honestly, I have to say, um, you know, obviously I've had a, I have had a few small businesses that have just never taken flight, and I would say it was because I didn't know what resources were available to me, or I was too afraid to ask. Um, I don't know if that was pride or what that was, um, but yeah, for me it was it was always financial or um, just not knowing what I had access to resource-wise. Yep. Well, one thing, it's because we talk, you talked about this, it's how you are your business. So, and we, I totally see that, that when people see me on the street, they're like, oh, that's the on and on girl. And it, it's hard to take the next step and let other people do it, though, too. So that's been a challenge for me. So to have employees and to trust that they're going to do just fine without me there, I don't have to greet every customer that comes in because it is your baby. Yeah. So that, that's been a, probably a big challenge for me. But that's a good problem to have, that mm -hmm. I don't need to be there, that I can work on you know, higher level things in the business. We're working yeah. on a new business right now that we're trying to get up and running. So that's, that's always good that you don't have to be there in the day to day. It's hard to um, trust someone with something you love and expect them to have that same affection and love and passion for it as you do. Yes. So I, I definitely get that. Um, all right, last question. Do you have any advice for freelancers or people who are in the, the gig economy when it comes to being creative? 
I have a little bit of advice. Um, and this, again, it's just based on my experience, so if others may have other experiences, but um, one would be hire an accountant to help you with your taxes. Um, don't, yeah. like, I know we're brilliant mm. people over here, but um, let somebody else handle that. Mm -hmm. um, have a network, because that's where you're going to find mentors, and um, you're going to keep learning. Um, yeah, and define success for yourself in your own terms, right? Like, I think life, that's sort of what life is about, too, untethering, like, what, what you know, we're conditioned to want versus, like, what we really want. So, like, for you, you and your own business, staying true to, like, what success is going to look like for you is going to be really helpful. I have something, too. A lot of the freelancers we work with really struggle with um, how to price what they're doing. And often, interestingly enough, um, really undervalue what they have to offer or they're afraid right, to ask for the price that they think they deserve. And so I think there's, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, but I think really digging into that and making sure that you're, um, you're charging a, a price that's fair to you that will also attract the people you're trying to attract um, and that you work on building the confidence to, to ask for that price. And that builds over time. But that is something I do see people struggle with, and they often, um, we will often have people come in and say, well, I'm just, you know, trying to build my experience. You know, I'll do it for free or something like that. And sometimes that works for some people, but we say, you're worth, you know, your time, your whatever you're producing is really worth something. So um, build that confidence and don't be afraid to ask for what you deserve. And I think building on that one as well, that goes back to the community aspect, is that as a freelancer, you don't want to be the person who's undercutting everyone in the area um, because you, you set up a weird paradigm where people are expecting from you at that lower price point what they would get from somewhere else, someone else. Um, and then when you go to raise prices, it looks like you're asking for too much because they got so little from you. And so definitely value yourself and understand how the market works. Um, but also, going back to the, the community aspect, just because you're a freelancer and you will have competition in the market doesn't mean that these aren't people that you can't be friends with, that mm -hmm. you can't reach out to. Um, Sam is here, and I've worked with Sam on a few different things, and Cole and Park have partnered on things before, and on paper, we're not supposed to be friends, and if they call, I always answer, um, you know, because it's a community. And so, but, you know, it's businesses, but when I was a freelancer as well, and I freelanced in another state and moved here as well, um, I never viewed other freelancers or other businesses as my competition. They were collaborators. They know the market. They know people. They have over overflow sometimes of work that they can't do like if you're in that gig economy realize that everyone else who's in that gig economy with you really are your brethren and so mm -hmm. that you can build that way and you can build and you may find a business with other freelancers or other gig economy people where you can put a business together and start something um, but that you know th those are the people who are your community and that you need to learn to rely on them and be there for them to rely on you as well nice that's great so I would also say, um, and I think Cole and I were talking about this last night, you know, working in the arts as arts administrators and also artists ourselves, and, and I'm sure everybody at this table probably has had this experience where, as creatives, we very often get asked to provide things for free, right? Donate this piece of artwork to our auction. Do this lighting for my, sh for sound for my show for free. And what we really have advocate for, and, and if you're not a creative but you work with them, please advocate for them to be fairly compensated for their work. What I tell people all the time is you don't ask an electrician to come to your house and fix your electricity for free. Folks have spent thousands of hours honing their craft over and over to be really good at what they do. They deserve to be fairly compensated for it. And so I would say to creatives, it goes back to what Dan said, really value that and don't undercut yourself and don't because you're also undercutting your peers. But yeah, also make sure that you're that for your people when you're working with creatives that you're paying them fairly. Nice. Um, I really appreciate all of the terrific information, advice, and guidance that you've provided to us today. It was amazing hearing uh, these statements from you guys. I appreciate everyone coming out and being in attendance to gain this information and understanding about business and marketing and how to, how to start a creative business uh, what, wherever point you're at right now. And uh, thank you. I think we'll be wrapping up shortly. Yeah, any, any questions from the audience? Here? Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Nick, and I run a filmmaking business, uh, but I also 
I'm interested in starting a nonprofit. Are you, do you, do you have any um, tips or any information on how to get started, or would that be something to go through and do uh, for that, those resources? Uh, the question is, do we have any tips or advice on starting a nonprofit organization? So I will say that the Small Business Development Center is not able to serve nonprofits. We can only serve for-profits, but um, we have some great partners in the room, including Kurt Bauman right <laughs> near you, with the um, Nonprofit Community Assistance Center at Nepal Alliance. Um, there is an organization called SCORE with volunteers who can help you create a plan for a nonprofit, and so we can definitely um, connect you with resources um, in the region that can help with something like that. Anyone else? I mean, the only thing I would say, and this might be a little controversial, I'm not sure, but I have worked for both nonprofit and for profit. And I would say if you're starting a nonprofit, um, don't have the mentality of a nonprofit. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Um, that does make sense. I think mm -hmm. nonprofits get stuck in this mentality um, that hinders them and creates barriers for them as opposed to propelling them forward. So that's just my own experience. I'm only speaking mm -hmm. from experience. But that would only be, that would just be advice. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure about resources, but that would be advice. Here. So having a creative business and then being a creative yourself, how do you find the balance between what's creative for business and what's for yourself and make time for that? Like, for instance, Dave, I think you have a podcast. I don't know if you consider that a business. Chrissy, I think you came out with Unstuck last year. I don't know if you consider that business or that's a book you did for yourself. So where do you find that time and balance? I believe the question is uh, the balance between uh, personal creative business and your, your just your personal creative for yourself. Well, I'll start with Unstuck, um, which is a short illustrated uh, book about uh, my, my journey through stuckness with my own creativity. Um, and I had to take time, like I had to work on that like in the evenings, um, you know, so I was really working very long days to make Unstuck happen, um, but it felt really important to me. Um, that being said, I now use Unstuck in the business. So we're running creative workshops for people um, in and around their own relationship with stuckness or their own creativity and using the book um, as a as a jumping off point for the workshop, so everybody who registers gets a copy of the book. Um, we use it for different at different points. Um, so it's a little bit like it started as a creative personal project, and then I'm sort of like continuing to leverage that in my business. And I think other people might have different ways of incorporating their personal practice into their business. Um, so for me, the podcast is not a business, but it's part of Park. Um, and so I, I consider it to be a podcast that Park creates along with the other ones. Um, but for me, it's, I have to, so when I first started Park Multimedia, it was a, a DBA and it was the evenings. That was my evening job. And this was sort of the passion in me being creative and all those things. And when I finally went full time in 2018 and got the LLC and did all those things, like on the one hand, it freed up the evening so that like I had time to do other stuff, but <laughs> my hobby is being creative. And so there's a lot of work and photos and like I, I do a photo a day where I'm editing photos and doing things that I put out on social media. Um, but my evenings now are meant for my personal creative. And so it took a while to get there but like there's a point where I have to mentally switch off and say I'm no longer the business owner creative I'm creating my own things and so like I've got tons of stuff that will probably never see the light of day because the intention is that it wasn't supposed to it was for me and so like but all of that creative work does help me in the business in the long run because as I get better at doing different types of photography that I'm just doing for, for fun I'll probably leverage that toward the business eventually um, we were talking earlier about like how do I stay on top of different social media and, and understanding like I, I'm a data nerd as well and like I love going down holes on Wikipedia and learning different things and eventually 
I usually end up putting it into the business. And so I think it's one of those, depending on what you do as your creative getaway, it will sometimes end up in the business in the long run. But there's a hard line that I have to make, you know, in my day where I'm like, all right, if I'm picking up the camera, this cannot go for a client or for something else. Like this has to be for me only. Um, but I also need that because there was a stretch where I wasn't creative, creating personally. And I saw a dip in my work ethic and my work, at, and not, the, not the ethic, but just what I was doing in my energy levels because I wasn't refilling that well either. So mm -hmm. I think it's important balance that has to be there, but for everyone it's going to be different. Uh, the question is, uh, coming out of this pandemic, kind of post-pandemic, but not really, what, what networking groups are starting back up to help us be more in contact with each other? <laughs> All right, really quickly, sorry for everybody who already heard me say that, but uh, we are called NEPA Creative. We have a private Facebook group where you can connect with creatives in the area as well as a public pa Facebook page. Uh, we meet every third Tuesday of the month um, in downtown Wilkes-Barre at, at Kirby Park under the uh, Marts Pavilion. And we have two breakout sessions per creative meetup. It's free to attend. And the breakout sessions are members of the creative community who share their art or their passion. And uh, you don't have to be creative to come, but you can come and learn about the creativity that's happening in the area. And we also pay the breakout sessions a uh, $50 stipend for participating. Um, so you can apply to be a breakout session leader on our website, nepacreative.com, nepacreative.com, as well as you could join our, our creative directory uh, so you can connect with other creative direct creators in, in the area. That's a new thing we just launched, and we would love for anybody to check out that directory and, and create a profile. I had a meeting with your uh, co-founder to maybe bring some up to Lackawanna County that we could sponsor and invest in. Did you have one last question? For uh, I, yes, I have an overall comment that at the intersection of creativity and, and business creation often gets overlooked, and that is that the same techniques and individual learns in the creative process also opens your minds to more business solutions and business opportunities. And that's very important to understand as you're making these transitions. The other aspect of that that also gets overlooked, and it kind of disappoints me a bit, is that when people are discussing the educational value of the arts, lots of curriculum, Take a segregated approach to the arts, whether it's visual arts or the performing arts. Whereas, if the educational artists, creators, could see themselves as infusing their lessons into other lessons plans, they would do much better in proposing budgets. Yeah. We just had that. Thank you. Um, go, go ahead. I thought you were. We just had that conversation uh, last night about, you know, helping artists merge with business. Or many of you, sometimes we forget artists can bring something to our organizations, a new kind of creativity. So we encourage you to hire artists, as we said, and bring them maybe into your planning processes. And I just wanted to mention, I'm glad the point was made about paying artists. Our office is a huge advocate for artists. Those musicians, Jimmy lives in Wilkes-Barre. He had to drive up here. You know, they practice. They have to, you know, take their equipment around. So if you need help, don't be afraid for it. Take all, it's not just the half hour performance. It's driving, it's practicing, it's, you know, preparing, caring. So yeah, we, we really believe in paying our artists. So if you're interested in doing some gigs for us, happy to talk to you about that. But um, I think, uh, I think uh, that we've come to the end, unfortunately. I love networking. Uh, hopefully we'll do more of these. I want to thank our esteemed panel. <laughs> and Travis for being a great moderator. Yeah. And uh, our commissioner for joining us. And all of you, we know you're, business, you're busy, whether you're running a small business or working for an organization. So thank you so much. Let's all keep in touch um, and have a great day. Thank you.